Well, good morning. Welcome to worship at Central United Methodist Church this day. I am so glad that you are here, whether you are part of our online congregation or whether you are worshiping in person today. My name is Reverend Amy Seifert. Uh, it, I serve as the pastor here at Central. And if this is your first time visiting us or your first time visiting in a while, a special welcome to you on behalf of the entire congregation here at Central. We have entered into the season of Lent. This is the first Sunday in Lent, and we are beginning a new worship series where we're going to look at the, uh, the Gospel of Luke. And Luke pays particular attention to the fact that Jesus spent a lot of time with people that were considered others in society, the outcasts, the sinners, the unclean, the people that uh, the rest of society didn't want to be around. That's where Jesus spent most of his time, caring for, for those others. And Christ calls us to do the same. And so we're going to spend uh, these weeks in Lent learning uh, how we can do that better. We are uh, glad to have Max Mays with us this this day and for next week as uh, Karen is taking a couple of weeks vacation and so uh, we always enjoy when Max is here and so uh, thank you Max for for being with us these next couple of weeks. Uh, for those of you who are part of the online congregation, there's a little bit of a different format. Uh, if you're watching live right now on the, um, the church webpage, you'll notice to the left of the screen that you are watching is a book that says check in, or a box rather. Uh, you can put your name, your, uh, I think your email, and perhaps your phone number. Uh, if you will do that, that lets us know that you are worshiping with us. Um, if you're watching later on, on Sunday or later on in the week, if you could go ahead and still leave a comment um, under the screen, if you're on Facebook or whether you're on our YouTube channel, uh, that lets us know that you are wor worshiping there today, is wh whatever day it is that you're worshiping. Uh, if you can do that, that helps us keep connected to everybody during our, this hybrid worship time. For all of us now, though, no matter if you're here, if you're online, or you're watching later in the week, I invite you uh, to center yourself as we begin uh, our worship this day. Our worship leader, Becky Harris, will come and lead us in our call to worship and our opening prayer. The words will be on your screen. If you're in person, there is a bulletin you can follow as well. And if you're here in person, I would invite you to rise as you're able as we worship this day. Will you please join me? Bless the Lord God of Israel who remembers the covenant with our ancestors and brings salvation from our enemies. Because of our God's deep compassion, the dawn from heaven will break upon us to give light to those who are sitting in darkness, to guide us on the path of peace. Bless the Lord who lifts up the lowly and fills the hungry with good things, who calls all people and seeks the outsiders outcasts and outlaws. Bless the Lord God of Israel. Will you pray with me? God, open our hearts and minds to receive your word. Thank you for your faithful servants who have handed down to us sound instruction and a trustworthy witness to your son, Jesus Christ. As the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, grow within our hearts a love for your son and a willingness to follow him. Fill us with your Holy Spirit and give us confidence in what you teach us today. Amen. Our opening song this day is the hymn, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. Uh, it is in the Red Hardback Hymnal, number 66, if you'd like to use that. The words will also be on your screen. So let us sing our praises this morning.
us take a moment to welcome one another to worship. We have several guests and visitors with us. Phyllis Grant has her family uh, with her today, so make sure you say hello to them. And if you're wondering who this tall blonde in the front almost front row is, uh, my daughter is visiting here from for the weekend. Uh, and so uh, let's take a moment to welcome one another. Make sure you greet Missy up in the AV booth and everyone who is worshiping online with us this day. So let's greet one another and welcome to worship. Please be seated. <laughs> oh, there are a number of announcements for the community that I would share with you at this time. Uh, what you, the beautiful flowers that are over my right shoulder, so to your left, are from uh, Phyllis Grant and her family. Uh, they are in uh, memory of Larry Grant, Phyllis's husband. And so uh, thank you for, for remembering Larry in such a beautiful, um, beautiful way. L yellow roses were his favorite. And so uh, we are, are celebrating uh, still and uh, memorializing the life of Larry Grant and the impact that he had on all of us here today. Church Council uh, will meet tomorrow evening at 6 o'clock, so if you are a part of that leadership team, I uh, hope to see you there then. The Women's Bible Study on Tuesday mornings is uh, starting this week, this Tuesday at 10 o'clock, and so uh, if you have signed up to be a part of that, um, please plan to be here at 10 o'clock. If you did not get signed up, I need to know uh, pretty quickly so I can make sure I get a book here in time for you. So uh, we are studying the names of God and what those names uh, teach us about God's nature. And so that we're looking forward to, uh, to that time. There, if you are a part of our choir, uh, just a reminder, there is no rehearsal this Wednesday uh, since Karen is gone, but there is bell choir rehearsal. So Mass Street Ringers will meet at 6.30 Mass Street Singers will not at 6 o'clock. And if you ordered Girl Scout cookies from the Brownie Troop that meets here at Central, uh, they will be here after worship today uh, to pick them up. Remember, if you have, did not order online, uh, they take cash and check to get your cookies. If you ordered online and paid with a card, they will have them here for you to pick up. So I uh, hope you got enough. I, I hear the Girl Scout cookie booths around town are uh, starting to wrap up. So, you know, you have to get a year's supply of cookies. They freeze. Can you tell I was a Girl Scout mom? <laughs> um, the other way that we uh, join together in community is joining in the joys and concerns that we each share. And so as we move into a time of prayer, uh, a couple of prayer concerns that have come in that uh, I, would at, I would list for you this morning and ask that you uh, remember them during your prayers throughout the week. Prayers have been requested uh, by Stacy Reasoner for her mom, Kathy Sumner, and Kathy's husband, Richard. They're both having some health issues right now, and so uh, prayers are, are coveted for them at this time. Uh, some of you know Bob and Lorraine Schrock. They are, are part of our uh, shut-in community, are not able to, to be here on a weekly basis. Um, their daughter, Allison's husband, Kevin Istis, uh, I received a call from her Friday. They've been married a little over a year. Um, Kevin is in his final time with, uh, with cancer. He has uh, been transferred to a hospice house and um, is not expected to make it 
uh, throughout through the weekend. And so um, I know Allison would covet your prayers for her husband, Kevin. Um, and uh, let's remember Bob and Lorraine and all of the family as well. Um, I would covet some of your prayers. Many of you know that I'm a caretaker uh, for my grandfather. He was, we put him on hospice on Wednesday. Uh, he is making that transition from life to life eternal. And um, all of the roller coaster things that go along with that. So uh, I would covet your prayers for my grandfather, um, who is no, he knows where he's going, uh, but for my mother and my uncle who are uh, helping care for him during these, these times. And uh, a reminder also, we've been mentioning the victims of the earthquakes in Syria and Turkey. Uh, Bishop Wilson has put out uh, a, a request uh, if churches and individuals in those churches uh, would like to help those victims of those earthquakes. Um, UMCOR is, is our, our worldwide um, aid organization through the United Methodist Church. 100% of donations given to UMCOR go to the, the places that they're intended because the administrative costs are covered by the United Methodist Church. And so um, if you are looking for ways that you can help, not only the victims of, of the earthquakes, but of floods, and uh, fires, uh, any natural disaster, uh, there are different ways that you can do that through UMCOR. So I'd invite you to visit their website, umcor.org, where you can make an online donation, or if you'd like and prefer, you can make a donation to Central designated for UMCOR, and we will send that along to them. Are there other joys or concerns that we would share this day? Yes, Sue. Wonderful. Uh, Sue is passing on thanks from her sister, Nancy. We have been praying for Nancy's husband, Kent, uh, who has been in the hospital with some uh, diabetic complications. He is doing well and hopes to be transferred to a rehab facility this week. And so uh, thank you for the prayers, but keep them coming. So are there other joys or concerns this day? I would invite you then now to join me in a time of prayer. Uh, Becky will come and lead us in a unison prayer of confession. Uh, you can follow that on the screen or in your bulletin. You'll then have some moments to pray silently, and then I will offer a pastoral prayer on behalf of our congregation. So let us go to God in prayer this day. Lord God, as we search our hearts through this season of Lent, we confess that we have sinned. We have turned away from those in need. We have not lifted up the lowly. We have strayed from your will. We have failed to do the things you have called us to do. We have looked on others with judgment rather than compassion. Forgive us, we pray. Lift us out of our sin and fill our hearts with your goodness and love. See us as we are. Show us mercy and remember us today. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, your son. How can it be, O oh God, that as we gather here today, it is the first Sunday in Lent. 
How can it be that we are in the wilderness preparing to walk toward Jerusalem when it seems that only a few weeks ago we were gathered together in the wonder, in the stillness of a stable? We realize how quickly time passes. During this Lenten journey, let us strive to live each moment to the fullest. When we are tempted to squander an hour in foolishness, turn us instead to spending the hour wisely. When we find ourselves looking back at the past with regret, turn us around, not to thoughts of the future, but to the present moment, walking purposefully in the present and in your presence. When we are of a mind to hold on to a grudge and withhold forgiveness, keep us centered in your love, gracious God, that we might be able to share the gift of your love with each person we meet. Keep us mindful that Lent is a journey. As we have brought our joys and concerns to you this day, we bring ourselves as well, recognizing we stand in need of your love, your grace, your mercy, and your healing. Draw all of us closer to you during the season of Lent, that we might go to be your Easter people. We ask all of these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to say when we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our next hymn is Lord who through whose love through humble service might be a new one for you, but it's pretty easy to catch on to. It's number 581 in the hymnal, where the words will also be on your screen.
thank you to everyone who supports the ministries and mission of Central United Methodist Church through your gifts and tithes and offerings uh, that allow us to continue serving uh, God's kingdom here in Lawrence and throughout uh, the world. There are several ways that you can make a gift to the church if you uh, would like to do so. If you are worshiping in person, there's an offering plate outside of this worship space where you can, um, you can leave your, your donation in that. You can also visit our website, lawrencecentral.org, or you can scan the QR code uh, on your screen that takes you directly to the site where uh, there is a safe secure online uh, portal through Vanco where you can make a donation or you can mail your checks to the church at the address that is on your screen. But we take a moment now uh, to bless and consecrate the gifts we have received this last week uh, for God's use and God's purposes. So if you would please join me in a prayer of dedication following along on the screen or in your bulletin. If you would pray with me. Lord, from the abundance of your grace, your word has provided all that we need. All that we have is yours. Receive the offering of our hands and the gratitude of our hearts. In the name of our Savior, we pray. Amen. During these weeks of Lent, where we are called uh, for an intentional time to draw closer to God, uh, and to reflect upon his life, his works, his missions, his teaching, and ultimately his sacrifice on the cross and his resurrection. We will be using an affirmation of faith that goes along with the uh, worship series that we'll be using. And so uh, I would ask you to affirm your faith by uh, reading the statement uh, that will be on your screen in a moment with me or following along in your bulletin. It is based uh, on Luke chapter 1, verses 46 to 45. So if you would please join me in affirming your faith. With all my heart, I glorify the Lord. In the depths of my soul, I rejoice in God my Savior. God has looked with favor on those of low status. The Mighty One has done great things for us. God shows mercy to everyone from one generation to the next. God scatters those with arrogant thoughts and proud inclinations and welcomes sinners and outcasts. God pulls the powerful down from their thrones and lifts up the lowly. God fills the hungry with good things and sends the rich away empty-handed. There is rejoicing in heaven when sinners repent, when those who are lost have been found. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Amen. Becky, would you come share our scripture this morning? Our scripture today comes from Luke chapter 1, verses 46 through 55. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servants, servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. Thank you. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of Holy Scripture. Can we start today with a pop quiz? It, it's an easy question. It's a yes, no. How about that? Have you ever had a time when you felt like an outcast or an outsider? Yeah. I, I suspect most of us probably have. Now, 
I know this is going to come as a huge shock to you all, but when I was younger, I was not the epitome of athletic ability. I know you're shocked. I know it. I know it. But my athletic ability was, well, let's just say I, I excelled in music, and we'll leave it at that. But when it came time to choose sides for the kickball team, needless to say, I was one of the last ones picked. Which is probably why I remember a little boy named Nathan so well. Nathan was a student at St. Francis Xavier Catholic Elementary School in Sartell, Minnesota. Todd and I had moved to St. Cloud right after we were married, so he, that was where he had his first uh, newspaper editor position. And so we moved to St. Cloud, and I taught elementary music. I was shared between two Catholic elementary schools. I'm probably one of the only Protestants that can play a mean Catholic mass, if I have to, or at least I used to be able to. Well, at St. Francis Xavier, once the classes, the music classes that I taught had earned enough reward points, if they came and they were good in class, they earned a sticker, they got so many stickers, and then they got to choose a fun day for music. They could bring music from home, we could play a game, we could do other things, and one of the games that they could choose to play was Disney Name That Tune. Now, it was the game Name That Tune with all songs from Disney movies. And the kids, like, kind of like Family Feud, they would come up and they would, would go against one other person and I would play a little, a little piece of the song and as soon as one of them recognized it, they hit the bell and if they got it right, they got points. So, like me... Nathan wasn't very athletically inclined either. He wasn't the first person picked for the kickball team. But Nathan was a Disney movie connoisseur. There was not a Disney song that he could not name. And when the kids learned this, he was the first person picked. For the team. He was no longer the outcast or the outsider. During Lent, we're going to touch on some of the major themes in the Gospel of Luke. And we're going to be using Adam Hamilton's book as a guide each week. And we'll focus on how Jesus continues to seek today, just as he did when he walked the earth the outcasts, the sinners the outsiders. We'll start with some background about Luke's gospel. Most mainline scholars think it was written somewhere in the first century between AD 75 and 90. Now, the author is not identified in the text, I, Luke, write this gospel. We, we don't have anything like that, but traditionally it's attributed to a physician and a companion of Paul who was named Luke. And this, this person wrote the book of the Gospel of Luke and also its sequel, the, the book of Acts. The Gospel of Luke is addressed to a man named Theophilus who might have been a wealthy individual who commissioned Luke to write this Gospel. And the author does state his goal very early in the Gospel. And that is to write a carefully ordered account of the life of Jesus, having investigated everything carefully, so that his audience might have confidence in the soundness of the instruction that you have received. Think of him as like a first century investigative journalist. It's in the Gospel of Luke that we see many of the beloved stories that many of us can tell or quote, even if we can't pinpoint exactly what chapter and verse it is. We find the story of Zacchaeus, 
in the Gospel of Luke. We find the parables of the prodigal son and the good Samaritan. Luke is the gospel that tells us about Jesus and the disciples on the road to Emmaus on the day of Christ's resurrection. And these are great stories. But if we pay close attention to what Luke writes, we'll see some important details that don't appear as clearly or as prominently as in the other gospels. Luke points out the emphasis of Jesus' appeal to outsiders, outcasts, and outlaws. What was it that drew those others to Jesus? Luke points, focuses on Christ meeting the marginalized, the broken, those who felt unseen or alone or cast aside by society. And so we begin our series today by looking at a few groups that could be viewed as outcast during Christ time and still can be viewed as outcast today. And we're going to start with a group that might be near and dear to your heart because you might be one of these older individuals. There are times, I am all too quickly discovering, that as we get older, we find that there are things that we can't do that we once used to be able to do. Sometimes we don't feel as useful as we once did. But Luke's gospel has something to say about that. And that is that Jesus will make use of your gifts and your talents regardless of your age. Older people aren't just useful for God. They are essential for the work of the kingdom. Let's revisit, excuse me, revisit a story that we looked at during Advent. It's the one about Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth. Zechariah was a priest who received a visit from an angel who told him that he and his wife, who had never been able to have children, now were going to conceive and have, have a child, even though they were older. Now, this couple was almost certainly in their 60s, but they could have been in their 80s. They're not sure. But Zechariah and Elizabeth weren't chosen despite their age. They were chosen because of their age in order to show God's glory and power. And they were not the first and the only older people who were called into God's service that we find in the Bible. Abraham and Sarah were 190 years old respectively when Isaac was born. I can't even imagine having a child at 90. Moses was 80 when God called him to lead the Israelites from Egypt. So Zechariah and Elizabeth are just another example of God choosing experience when it came time for some important service. Another example comes from Luke chapter 2, verses 25 to 38. It's another story in which God uses older individuals to recognize the tremendous gift the people of Israel have received when Jesus was born. The story goes like this. A man named Simeon was in Jerusalem. He was righteous and devout. He eagerly anticipated the restoration of Israel and the Holy Spirit rested on him. The Holy, the Holy Spirit revealed to him that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Led by the Spirit, he went into the temple area. Meanwhile, Jesus' parents brought the child to the temple so that they could do what was customary under the law. Simeon took Jesus in his arms and praised God. He said, Now, Master, let your servant go in peace according to your word, because my eyes have seen your salvation, 
You prepared the salvation in the presence of all peoples. It's a light for revelation to the Gentiles and a glory for your people Israel. Jesus' father and mother were amazed by what was said about him. Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This boy is a sign to be the cause of the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that generates opposition so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your innermost being too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, who belonged to the tribe of Asher. She was very old. After she married, she lived with her husband for seven years. She was now an 84-year-old widow. She never left the temple area, but worshipped God with fasting and prayer night and day. She approached at that very moment and began to praise God and to speak about Jesus to everyone who was looking forward to the redemption of Israel. This story is a reminder that even in old age, we need to keep our eyes and ears open for the opportunity to see God in all that we experience. This old man and this old widow have been waiting to see the long-awaited Messiah. And Luke tells us that Simeon was led by the Spirit. He just had one of those feelings, hmm, I think I'm going to go to the, prof or to the temple today. The Spirit led him on that day to go to the temple. And Anna was a woman who never left the temple area. And together, these older individuals offer testimony that this baby is the Savior. Now notice what they did. They trusted that God would fulfill the promise of a Messiah. They expected this to happen. They kept their faith despite all of their hardships, despite the Messiah not coming along when they maybe thought that he would. Simeon and Anna maintained a sense of anticipation, experiencing the fruit of the Spirit, patience. That's something else I didn't get a whole lot of, along with athletic ability, is patience. They kept watch so they would not miss God's presence amid the noise of life that we all encounter. They exercised the wisdom that they had honed over the years, which came in handy as they assessed the situation in the temple that day. And when they saw the baby Jesus, they didn't keep silent. They spoke openly and they praised God to anyone and everyone who would listen to them. Now Simeon and Anna may have been cast off in the society in which they lived because of their age, but they were a gift to people around them for their actions that day. Just as older folks around us are gifts to younger people. So if you categorize yourself in that label of older individuals, be sure to share your wisdom as Simeon and Anna did. Share your experience as they did after their years of waiting. Don't be bashful about sharing leadership as the two of them did with all who witnessed them praising Jesus that day. And above all, Never stop anticipating God's willingness to call you to serve in ways great and small, regardless of your age. But of course, God doesn't just call the more experienced among us. We read about that in the book of Luke as well. Who did God choose to be the mother of the Son of God? a teenaged girl named Mary. And that's a powerful reminder that young people can be given great responsibilities. Remember, Samuel was just a boy when God called him to be a prophet. 
David was a, a boy when he killed the giant Goliath with a, a sling and a stone. Esther was a young woman when she became the queen of Persia and saved the Jewish people from a terrible scheme. Oh, the scouts are here. Do we need to pause and go get our cookies? <laughs> oh, Esther was a young girl, and Mary was just a girl when she was called to bear a great burden. God's calling of these young people is different than young people can be treated in society today, right? Oh, they're too young to know anything. They don't have a clue about how the world really works. Have you said some of these things? How wise can someone really be having lived only this short a time? We can treat the young and relatively inexperienced as outcasts, or we can at least marginalize them by not listening to their ideas and by not considering the gifts and graces that they have to offer. Yet who do we turn to when we can't figure out our phone, when we can't figure out our computer, when we can't figure out our iPad or our tablet? Elliot's back there, yeah, me, Mom. <laughs> If we are willing to listen to young people to help us with our smartphones, perhaps the church and other aspects of society should listen to young people for their ideas on other subjects. Throughout Luke, God calls the lonely and the marginalized into service. And then God helps them succeed in their mission and no doubt exceed their own expectations. Becky read for us earlier what's known as Mary's Magnificat in Luke. This is the song that she sings after she has become pregnant with Jesus. She goes to visit her cousin or relative, we're not sure which, Elizabeth. And we're told Elizabeth's child, another woman who was pregnant older in life, we're told that the child in her room leapt for joy at recognizing the mother of his Savior. And Elizabeth honors and blesses Mary. And then Mary sings this song, the Magnificat. And there's one verse, verse 52, that sums up this first lesson from Luke Best. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. Jesus spent three years of his ministry standing up for the least, the last, and the lost. He wasn't connected with people in power positions. He wanted to bring hope to the lowly and salvation for all. Those words from Mary, he has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly, serve as both a promise and a calling as we start this season of Lent together. A promise that God will uphold what Jesus did on earth and continue to lift up the lowly. And it also is a calling. Certainly God can intervene miraculously as he did in many of the stories that we can recall from Luke. But more often, the lifting of the lowly requires us to serve as the hands and feet of Christ. Mary, a lowly girl from a nothing family in a backwater town that nothing good ever comes from in Nazareth, was of no consequence, but God chose her anyway. Her son, Jesus, no doubt was looked on as lowly and of no, of no consequence as well. But consider what Mary said when the angel visited her to tell her about the, her mission as the mother of God's only son. 
We talked about it during, Lent, during Advent. I am the Lord's servant. Let it be with me just as you have said. May we take those words to heart as we embark on this journey with Jesus toward the cross. Amen. Our closing hymn is a version of Mary's Magnificat. It's, My soul gives glory to my God. I know it's probably a new one for you. Max is going to help us out and play it, play it for us so we can learn it real quick. It's number 198 in the hymnal if you'd like. The words will be on your screen as well. As we remember this day, I am the Lord's servant. Let it be with me according to thy will. I invite you here in person to rise if you're, as you're able as we sing our final hymn. Thank you. As we depart this time of worship, I send you with this blessing and a uh, comment that I will see you all next week. I have to get Emily back to the airport. <laughs> so uh, have a good week, and I will see you soon. But go now with this blessing. The Almighty One has done great things for us. Go forth as servants of the Lord who has pulled down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. And all of the people said, Amen. <laughs>